Welcome to Market Matters. I'm Nadia Hassan together with Suhi Azman. We're bringing you our companies in the news and as we are saying that the fact is third Q earnings season is upon us like a gigantic wave of disappointment that it apparently is going to shape up to. Uh, and we're looking at in the same theme that we were talking about for DG, we're talking about Maxis. Maxis. So Maxis uh, actually, of course, Maxis is king of prepaid. I mean, well, no, sorry, postpaid. postpaid. Yeah, I always keep messing them up. He's king of postpaid. And from the numbers that we saw today, I don't think it's going to change. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you look at the earnings rate that they announced in the afternoon, revenue went up by 4.8%, net profit went down by 6.5%. But even then, I think we're seeing a comeback story for Maxis, you know, since Morton Lundell joined Maxis in October 1st, 2013. Well, it's well yeah, it's, been, it's actually his two-year anniversary. And when he came in, I mean, I interviewed him when he came in and he was saying a lot about, look, he, he, he's very blunt. He'll say, tell you that, look, there's pain, there, there is going to be pain when it comes to this kind of thing. And, uh, but it was under him that they sort of revived Hotlink again. You know, mm. did, did you realise that for so many years, Hotlink was practically non-existent in the face of DG's gigantic yellow man? Yeah, I mean, it was very quiet as well. But Hotlink, to be fair, so, you know, um, it was one of the brainchild of one of the, uh, now is, uh, she's joined Astro, Dr. Rosalila, for instance. You know, uh, but on the other side, it's not, nothing much has been uh, with Hotlink, I mean, aside from the normal no, I, I think I think people I think people do like to welcome it back, mm -hmm. but Maxis, the, let's, let's not kid ourselves, the, the, the strength is in this sort of pre, what do you call it, postpaid segment, especially for a lot of corporates, mm -hmm. which of course when we were talking about DG, they said that's what they wanted to get. So it's not so much of like, it's just sort of hoping that, you know, the pear, pie is a bit more equally shared. Like I said, the net profit actually dropped due to unrealized for, forex losses from weakening ringgit and higher staff costs. It was because of that that the share price actually, well, marginal, 0.75% to about 6 ringgit 65. Okay, but, but the elephant in the room is that if you buy Maxis, you're buying it for dividends. Would you buy it for capital appreciation or is it more dividends? I think, I mean, for, if you were to ask me, I would prefer personally a uh, dividend because it will actually provide me with consistent return. Yeah, but then you see that is the, that's what people are taking away from it. The fact is that, uh, you know, the fact is that the dividends themselves seem to be shrinking as they want to kind of expect. Well, they've been you borrowing know? money to actually fund for the dividends. And, and <laughs> if you look at uh, uh, Maxis, right, BMI Research in the afternoon today announced, uh, said that um, they are very cautious on Maxis gearing at 2.1 times. Who, Alan Alliance, is it? Uh, uh, BMI Research. Okay, I see. And 210 or 10%. And it cut the target price by 10 cent to 660 cent. Alliance DBS, of course, thinks it's fully valued. And I think that's a argument that a lot of people share. We'll have to see whether it, Martin Lando pulls more stuff out of his head. Just to bring it all home, the fact is that Maxis announced their results today. They did have a slight decrease in net profit, but uh, that's because that's due to, sorry, uh, Forex gain, what do you call it? Forex losses. losses. Forex losses and uh, some other costs as well. And uh, most, most uh, research houses just seem a little bit cool, cautious cool, yeah. on how cautious, Maxis is yeah. going to go. But moving on to our Insider Asia stock of the day, and in that last sentence, I've actually lied to you because <laughs> The Insider Asia has decided to go for the sectorial approach because I think in times like this, sectorial approaches, maybe going sort of top down, gives a very, very look. And it's unsurprising given their MO that they actually like the FNB sector. Well, I think it's most one of the most defensive sectors. I think you also like consumer products in the Yes, right? I do. I mean, most people who watch this show and most people who used to follow me know that I, I tend to like retail. I like retail. I think it's very defensive. Even if the world ends tomorrow and zombie apocalypse comes, you'll still need to eat. Or and even Ellen become the prime minister. Uh, oh, God, please don't. <laughs> uh, it's worse than Donald Trump. Uh, so the retail, retail restaurant, so how they broken it down as we read the report was they broke it down to three sectors. A snack and confectionery companies, the guys who do the cakes, F&B companies with strong domestic brand names. And the third one is retail restaurant-based F&B. So of the three, they actually like two, two. the first two. And actually on Monday, if you catch the report, they'll be talking about Coco Land because Coco Land has a lot of product in terms of confectionery, biscuits, jelly beans. Do you eat jelly beans? No, uh, not really, not anymore. I mean, what about sector number two? It's like seg seg second segment. What else did they like about that? Well, they actually like the second segment because of the fact that they the, the, the high PE ratio of 21 to 29 times, but resilient earnings and attractive dividends. Um, uh, yields of 3 to 4.6% due to strong cash flow and low capex. If you look at the sector two, right, you know, um, you look at the uh, quick service restaurants, right? Well, no, no. Actually, we're going back to the second sector because we're looking at like Nestle, with, oh, which sorry, of course is like FNN. very, very, very strong in terms of the numbers and the Consumer share price as well. as well. And FN as well. Uh, FNN actually of all of them seems 
You know, I, I will tell the story till the cows come home. <laughs> I should have bought Nestle at 20 ringgit. It's 72 now. And that was yes. like, it grew to 60 ringgit over like the past four years. It's my biggest thing that I'm kicking myself in the behind for. Anyway, the, but the third one, like we mentioned, was the restaurants. And this one includes guys like Old Town. They seem to think that Malaysians will not eat out so much. Yeah, I think they think that, you know, there are still uh, more room uh, for growth for Old Town, basically. But they're underweight on it, aren't they? Yeah, they're quite underweight on that as well. Correct. Yeah, so anyway, just to bring it all home for us, uh, just inside the Asia sector of the day is actually FNB. They've split it into three, namely the guys who have uh, different products, uh, well, like cakes and sweets and etc. like that, and the ones who have strong brand names, sort of like Nestle and FNN, and of course the ones who do the restaurants, which are Old Town. They're very bullish on the first two, not so much on the last. And actually on Monday, you'll see why they actually like Coco Land, but... We cannot disagree, defensive sectors make sense. So anyway, that's all that we have for you on this happy hump day, which is Wednesday. I am Nadia Hassan together with Suhi Azman. And it's lovely weather outside. If you actually want to go out and pick up a copy of the Edge Financial Daily, we will not blame you for it. Or, you know, pick up a copy of the weekly when it comes out in a couple more days. Otherwise, go over to theedgemarkets.com. Good night. Mm -hmm.